Video. In May 2016, a researcher is attacked by an elephant. A ranger fires shots to drive the animal away. The sensory impression was so great that I could feel it later and think about it later. At the time, there was no time for thinking. Ian Redman is injured. How severe is still unclear. A colleague films the first minutes after the accident. Ian had named the lead cow that had attacked him Carly. Her image is burned into my retina. <laughs> yes, I would recognize her if I see her. Dense mountain forest stretches across the flanks of Mount Elgon in western Kenya. This is Ian Redman's area of research. The biologist has been on the trail of an extraordinary elephant population for decades. April and May are the rainy months. During this time, waterfalls and streams form everywhere. The inhabitants of the forest enjoy this to the fullest knowing it will soon be dry and hot again. Flying foxes are living in the caves. To find food, the herbivores fly out into the dense mountain forest. A special cosmos has formed here. Animals are hard to spot. Except for the jumping mantle gorezas. Zebras hide surprisingly well in the dense green. And even the elephants seem almost invisible in the thicket. They retreated from the savannah into the forest a long time ago. This unique population still exists thanks to biologist Ian Redman. One and a half years after his accident, Ian flies back to Mount Elgon. As always, he documents everything with his small camera. But this time, things are different. The attack has changed him. Uh, so going back, it's the same excitement that I always feel flying up the Rift Valley. Um, but the, the slight concern that that particular elephant might bear a grudge. Um, yeah, so. We will see. He has stepped out of the small machine dozens of times in the last 40 years, always in anticipation of the Mount Elgin elephants. That's still the case today, despite the accident. The wounds have healed, and so have the severe bruises and the shoulder injury. Only his neck hurts from time to time. From the small landing site in Kitali, it is another long drive to his destination, Mount Elgin National Park. Ian is about to see all those again who have supported him in his work for decades. Daniel, Daniel Namunai, a close and long-time ally who helps him to protect the elephants. I'm here, I'm fit, I'm well. David Kibirenge, Ian's right hand in the Mount Elgin National Park. He has an enormous knowledge of the cave elephants and is their protector on site. The rangers work on behalf of the Born Free Foundation, an organization dedicated to species protection. Current information, um, and, and how many days beyond? How many weeks? Were you monitoring them for a while then? <laughs> Already six weeks throughout, the rangers say. Okay, that's good. 
<laughs> Ian is mainly looking for his assailant, Carly. He wants to understand how it came to the accident. But the incident with her wasn't the only one in the last few months. A cattle herder. Yeah, a cattle herder was injured. Yeah. When they left here, when they left. Kelvin tells Ian that a shepherd was attacked and injured by an elephant. He must have tried to scare the elephant away when he was out grazing his animals. The elephant became aggressive and attacked him, injuring his leg. The shepherd was hospitalized but has recovered now. But he was rushed to the hospital, he's doing well now. Whenever the rangers go out, they're armed to protect themselves from poachers. In the 1970s, there were still 1,200 Mount Elgin elephants. Now, there are only a few hundred left. The search for the last herds is tedious, but Daniel and the ranger team are masters at tracking. Elephant manure on the way. Its temperature is an important indicator. It's still very fresh. They must be close by. Using ash, the rangers check the wind's direction in order to get within viewing distance of the animals. Because in the dense mountain forest, the elephants are almost invisible to humans. Daniel signals the rangers to take cover. And then the first Mount Elgin elephants appear, eating peacefully. They are slightly smaller than their relatives from the savannah. For Ian, this is the first encounter with elephants since his accident. Ian and his team have been noticed. The lead cow has discovered them. Like a year and a half ago, Ian can't put down the camera. He documents every behavior detail. For a moment, he's reminded of the attack. Despite the second of shock, Ian is overjoyed. Seeing elephants in dense bush is always exciting. And seeing elephants always puts a smile on your face. Very peaceful. And definitely not Kali. Yeah. It's almost like Kali, but not Kali. Oh, no, no, no. Kali had long, thin at us. She, she became aware of us. And she sent it towards us. She lifted her trunk to sniff. She put her ears out, but not in you know, a huge display, is listening and, and came forward towards us and we backed away. And that was enough for her. So she was t giving us a clear signal, back off. And we backed off and she carried on feeding. And that's the mother with the baby. So that's very good. Very nice. Good job. Thank you. Covering an area of almost 1,300 square kilometers, Mount Elgin National Park is a green island surrounded by fields and villages. It is the last retreat for many animals. Here they raise their offspring, here they're safe. At 4,300 meters, Mount Elgin is one of the highest mountains in East Africa. 
Only in the peak region the weathered volcanic rocks come to light. Further down at lower altitudes, the first trees hold their ground by forming a dense jungle. The lava roof of the caves acts like an umbrella. It protects the layers of ash and the mineral salts they contain from being washed out by rainwater and leachate. At the cave entrance, you can see what elemental force created this region 12 million years ago. Meter-thick layers of ash with chunks of lava sprinkled in. Between them, whole logs, whitish discolored. They bear witness to a catastrophic volcanic eruption. The caves offer an ideal habitat for the red-winged starling. Through weathering and breakage, niches and holes have formed in the old tree trunks. The nests of the red-winged starling are safe here. Here, also lies the only natural source of salt in the Mount Elgin region, because outside the volcanic caves, the soil is washed out and low in salt. Forty years ago, Ian Redmond began studying a phenomenon. It led him into the most famous cave, Kittum Cave, which is also an important place for humans. Ian's companion, David Kibarenge, was born here more than 70 years ago. You come down the steps from the warmth of the Sun, sunny forest, and this cool, dank air meets you. So it feels nice to come into the cool, but then the smell of the mixture of bat guano and elephant dung it might not sound like a wonderful smell, but you soon get used to it, and then it's very characteristic. Ian began his research in the cool seclusion of Kittum Cave. Locals had told him about mysterious scratches on the cave walls. Elephants were said to come here at night. Nobody knew exactly why, because it's hard to watch them in the labyrinth-like cave. Biologist Ian Redman wanted to know more about it. To anyone who hasn't heard of this cave, the idea of an elephant in a cave is, is, is crazy. What? Elephant and there's no light? It's dark, they're feeling their way in the dark, it just sounds crazy. But for these elephants, they come in with their mothers, it's what an elephant does. For them, it's normal. So it's part of the culture of this population. In the 1980s, Ian Redman spent six months at the entrance to Kittum Cave watching the elephants come in at night and then wander deep into the cave. He noticed that young animals were always present. He was the first one to take pictures of this nightly ritual. The cave seemed to hold a vital secret for the animals. Why else would the giants wander through the impassable terrain and leave scratch marks on the walls? Ian Redmond managed to gain the elephant's acceptance as a non-threatening observer. That way, he was finally able to uncover their secret. We're in this, uh, what is effectively a subterranean salt lick, uh, but elephants can't lick. Their, their tongue is behind a huge trunk and tusks, so they have to use their tusks, you can see here, to chew. This is hard rock, you know, my panga barely makes a dint. And yet they've got the pressure to push the tusks, break off little bits, then pick them up if they don't catch them, and put them in their mouths and, and eat the rock. And, and they're not hitting the rock, they're just pushing, and then their tusks skids 
and sometimes punches a hole. But uh, yeah, it is an amazing sight. Just like cows on the pasture lick salt, Elgin elephants need minerals to survive. Their plant-based food contains too little of them. But the salty ashes provide plenty. Within thousands of years, they have created a gigantic cave system through their mining activities. And they communicate themselves using these low rumbles. Now, what we hear is a rumble like But that's actually just the upper harmonics of a much deeper infrasonic rumble. Uh, I can't do the infrasound, but I thought if I make a rumbling sound, it would tell them that someone was there. And gradually, they seem to respond to this by not being aggressive uh, and not being frightened. It's, it's, the aggression comes out of fear. And if you can win their trust, then you habituate them to the presence of a harmless observer. For many years, Ian has been communicating with the cave elephants in this way. There were never any problems. David Kiborengi tells Ian that the locals also get along with the elephants. For a long time, they even shared the cave. The elephants assault hungry miners, the locals as the cave's inhabitants. The remains of a cattle shed. People moved to this dry place with all their livestock and belongings. Until today, the Kittum Cave is of special meaning to the locals. But for some decades, there have also been people who want only one thing, ivory. In the 1980s, the cave turned into a death trap for a group of Elgin elephants. A skull in a crevice bears witness to this. Carly, the elephant cow that had injured Ian so seriously, could also have witnessed the massacre. She was probably only a few years old at the time. Poachers in 1907 sat on top of the cave, and when the elephants were coming into the cave, they ambushed them and just fit, fired machine guns. Wounded a lot of elephants, and I came in, um, in 1987 and found several dead animals, um, one of whom I think was Charles, who I photographed tusking just around there. And his face had been sliced off, but in a clean plane. So that suggests you're someone with a chainsaw. Quick and efficient. Elephants remember those that killed a fellow elephant. The survivors of this massacre still associate the smell of people with danger. The many terrible experiences with poachers that the elephant researcher has had over the years brought him to initiate a spectacular action. In April 2016, tons of illegal ivory were burned in gigantic fires as a message to the world that the ivory trade must stop in order to stop the poachers and save the elephants. Mount Elgin National Park is an exceptional place, in part thanks to the elephants. The rock hyrax, who live in the crevices near the cave entrance, benefit from the elephants' cave visits. After an extensive salt feast, the pachyderms regularly leave behind their excrements. They fertilize the soil and thus create the basis for many herbivores. In the morning hours and in the late afternoon, they eat their fill in the lush greenery. They are not particularly choosy, as long as it's fresh and vegetarian. Bird life also benefits. The elephants, as the gardeners of the Mount Elgin forests, increase the biodiversity of the forest. This attracts insects, the main food of many birds like this little bee eater. In 
the surrounding area of Mount Elgin National Park, the world looks different. Agricultural land as far as the eye can see. People here live self-sufficiently. They clear the forest and plant fields. Ian knows that they have been coexisting with elephants for centuries. The locals have not been the reason for the aggressive behavior of the elephants, and yet here Ian was attacked by Carly. The group reaches the site of the accident. Ah, oh, they were crossing up there, yes. They're crossing that gap. Okay, this, this looks, Ian, this, this is like the, uh, the video I've got in, in the Majani Sawaya video. And Dovo and Apita, on the Voka Hoko. When Ian Redmond and his team filmed the herd of elephants here in May 2016, the lead cow suddenly turned around and ran towards him. I remember looking over my shoulder and seeing this <laughs> magnificent sight of an elephant athlete in full flight with the advantage of running downhill. She hit me and I've got a vivid sensory memory of when her face hit my hand. These two knuckles touched her tusk, which is cold and hard, and these two knuckles touched the soft upper lip where her trunk curls over the tusk. And <laughs> I, the, the impact knocked me over backwards into a backwards roll. My feet went up, but I, I didn't go sideways. I went straight over, my feet hit her chest. And then I was on all fours underneath her and, and trying to stay curled up and, and not let her feet stand on me. She must have screeched to a halt because her back legs didn't run over me. You'd think that an elephant running downhill, hitting someone, would just keep going. But she, she obviously screeched to a halt with me still underneath her. And we, when the elephant hit the camera against my hand, it turned the video off. And from the clock on the video, it was five seconds before one of the kicks turned it on again. <laughs> Shots finally drove Carly away. So I think, whoa, wait a minute, neck injury, lie down. So I laid down and started thinking, take stock, what, what can I do? And, and I found this arm, I could move the hand, but I couldn't move the shoulders, I couldn't lift that arm. And I, did, I tried to sit up again, um, but the, the buzzing of my hands was getting worse and the, the neck was hurting. So obviously I was, I was concerned about a spinal Injury. That was all right. This arm is good. Okay, good news. Leg, good. Good news. Oh, back, hurting. Leg, good news. As I did the backward roll, by chance, her foot was holding my shirt down. And that's why my shoulder dislocated. Because when you do a backward roll, it's best not to have an elephant standing on your shirt. I learn. <laughs> It's a good tip for gymnasts. When doing a backward roll, make sure an elephant is not standing on your shirt. That's an elephant footprint. It's not often you can track an elephant on your own clothes. <laughs> I don't blame Carly. You can't blame an elephant for being an elephant. Um, she, she was angry because she's got all this hassle around here of charcoal burners and poachers and woodcutters and, and illegal loggers and it's all happening around her, her habitat's disappearing, she's lost members of her family. And so Carly had accidentally hurt a protector. The habitat of elephants outside the National Park is getting smaller every year. Slash and burn farming, which has been practiced here since time immemorial, drives out and injures animals. It is a constant struggle for living space between humans and animals. It's quite depressing to see how isolated the Elgin elephants are. You're in a little island of elephant habitats in a sea of human agriculture and 
occupation. You're very conscious of the shrinking world of the elephant and the expanding world of humanity. At the borders of the national park, where the jungle has been replaced by arable land, the influence of humans becomes visible. It's not just a competition for food and living space. With his thermal imaging camera, Ian Redmond can show the land that man had cleared is much warmer than the forested national park area. The farmland is literally glowing. Ian is certain that this has an impact on the local climate and thus on all the plants and animals in the area. Ian was told about an elephant carcass found in the Mount Elgin area. He immediately thinks of Kali. I'm drawn to look at the skull. But this one was a bull in his prime. Look at this. They were in such a hurry that they didn't cut out the bone of the face and left half the tusk in the, well not half the tusk, the top uh, quarter or so of the tusk, which was, was up into the skull. People who value ivory wouldn't do that. But these are people who are in a hurry, breaking the law and value money. The last time I felt that against the palm of my hand was when I was holding Carly's front leg, trying to stop her from standing on me. But here, it's not living, pliable hairs of a, of a healthy elephant. It's, it's dry, dead hairs. China has closed its ivory markets at the end of 2017. The UK is tightening its regulations so that even old ivory isn't being traded because it can be mixed with new ivory and, and yet this has just been killed. There's still a demand. Some people are still buying elephants' front teeth. It's illegal. And I guess the message I would say from the carcass of this elephant is if you have ivory in your home and if you buy it and put it on your mantelpiece, it's no longer a status symbol. What you're saying is I, I support organized crime the killing of elephants and the murder of rangers and customs officers that are trying to stop this trade. It stinks in every sense. The Mount Elgin elephants are trapped here, surrounded by farmland and threatened by ivory hunters. Poachers do not stop at other animals either, not even within the borders of the national park. Ivory of poached elephants from the whole area is secured and stored in the park's evidence room. The large tusks weigh more than 20 kilos. These do not stem from Mount Elgin elephants, though. Their tusks are smaller. The senior park ranger shows Ian the tusks confiscated within the last few months. Although the price per kilo for ivory has more than halved within three years, poaching continues. These are the tusks of a Mount Elgin elephant cow. They are almost half the size of the savannah elephants and worn down because of the salt mining. The threat has gone down substantially, but it's not completely wiped out yet. So um, 
my message to the world is uh, we need to sustain the efforts uh, both locally and internationally to ensure that the elephants survive for generations to come. But not only the protection of the elephants is important. At Mount Elgin, everything is connected. If the number of elephants decreases, it will have an impact on the region's entire wildlife. From the bushbuck to the predator, all animals need the minerals dormant in the belly of the volcano. As soon as night falls, they dare to enter, driven by their hunger for salt. It's difficult and dangerous for the animals to find their way in the darkness. Tonight, a genet also looks for prey. It doesn't lick salt. The blood of the prey will provide it to her. Small vertebrates make up its menu. The little genet is a nocturnal loner. As it can climb very well, it is also able to reach the corners and crevices of the volcanic caves where bats or small rodents might hide. Ian's search for Kali continues, driving him and his team of rangers across the national park and beyond its borders to where the settlements begin and where the accident happened. Where is Kali? Ian asks everyone, including the pasturalists, who have their grazing grounds very close to the scene of the accident. One of the men has news for him. Carlos feels that, that Kali, the elephant, uh, and her family are ones that have become particularly aggressive. And he said that, that Kali um, has a little hole in her ear. And he postulates that that might be a poaching attack where she was injured. So she has personally been injured by a poacher and probably seen members of her family killed by poachers. And that's why when humans make her stressed, she reacts with anger. And it's a reasonable hypothesis. We can't know what's going on in her mind, but you put all these bits of information together and that's the picture that emerges. In their search for Kali, Ian and the rangers have found new hope. A herd is supposed to be approaching the Kittum cave. For weeks, there has been no sight of elephants there. The animals must be hungry for salt. Stop, 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 stop! The elephants are already near the cave entry. They have even brought their offspring along. It will learn to continue the old traditions of the cave elephants. Despite their size, the elephants can hide perfectly. Often enough, the rangers drive by very closely without even noticing them. The pachyderms disappear completely in the green thicket. Giant trees dominate the landscape in Mount Elgin National Park. At a height of just over 2,000 meters, the mountain forest begins, reaching up to an altitude of 3,000 meters. The elephants move with astonishing ease through the undergrowth.
They consume up to 300 kilos of food each day. Even thorns do not stop the animals from searching for food. This forest offers the Mount Elgin elephants everything they need. The loss of forest is not just, a, oh, what a shame, the trees are very nice. And the loss of elephants is, oh, what a shame, the elephants are really nice, we like elephants. Elephants are the gardeners of the forest. They eat the, the fruits and the, the seed pods, disperse the seeds for the next generation of trees, which are then involved in the water cycle, putting water vapor into the atmosphere, cooling the surface of the, the mountain. And all that is being reduced, reduced, reduced. We've got this little pocket of forest with a small population, maybe two or 300 elephants. We have to protect what's left. And ideally, we'd be, be looking to expand the forest range so that the ecosystem services which that forest provide for all the people around here and on a, on a global scale, maintaining a stable climate, that can continue. That's the mission here, not just to save a few elephants with an amazing, unique culture, but part of that bigger picture of trying to stabilize the climate and have a functioning biosphere so that we can all live in it. The habitat of Mount Elgin is a cosmos that has existed for millions of years. Its forests still harbor many less known and special species such as the black and white casked hornbill. It needs the evergreen forests and their fruits as well. Water bucks are still common here. Unlike the dry savanna, the humid Mount Elgin forests are an ideal habitat for them. While older males lead a solitary existence, the females join together with their young to form small herds. In the rainy season, when everything is green and there is enough to eat, most offspring are born. On this night, expectations are high that the elephants will enter the cave. Ian and the rangers have decided to wait near the Kittum cave. David Kiburengi, in particular, has a keen sense for elephants. It is near. It is coming now. Did they notice the humans close by? In the dark, the men must be especially careful. It's not just the elephants making their way through the night. A side-striped jackal is being watched by a bush baby in a tree. Plant eaters, such as the bush bucks, which cannot break any rock themselves, lick the crystallized salt from the rocks. And then they appear the cave elephants on their way to their workplace deep inside the volcano. 
they still have to conquer a distance of over 200 meters through a pitch black labyrinth until they reach the salt deposit. The phenomenon of elephants mining underground is unique in the world. Only protected by complete darkness do they dare to enter. Only then they are undisturbed by humans. Today, they are even more cautious than in 1987, the year the massacre happened. A kind of inner map helps them to find their way around the impassable cave. Information about paths and salt deposits has been passed down from generation to generation, probably for thousands of years. Only after hours of hard work have they licked enough salt and move on. At dawn, the flying foxes and bats returned to the caves of Mount Elgin. They also ate their fill at night, but instead of salt, they prefer flowers and nectar. The carnivores amongst them have eaten the elderly, sick or injured. They are the health police of the Mount Elgin forests and play their part in the survival of this ancient forest. All animals lead a kind of isolated existence on Mount Elgin. This is their last sanctuary. Far too few people are aware that this mountain forest is also the water reservoir for the whole region. It is the day Ian wants to undertake one last attempt to see Kali again. Suddenly, they can't go any further. Luckily, it's just a flat tire. No wonder considering the bad roads. The rangers quickly solve the problem. They're used to breakdowns. Ian hopes to get going in time. Within the last few days, a herd of elephants has been wandering from the fields into the forest each early morning crossing the high plateau where he last saw Kali. Ian and the rangers are once again back at the scene of the attack. And they are in luck. The elephants are here.
for a moment, it was, it was a flashback. I've been here before, fast moving elephants. Again, he looked magnificent because he was a fit elephant, like an athlete running, but I don't think he was directing his attention towards us. And we went across to the other side of the valley so we could watch them from a distance that, that was not affecting them. I haven't definitely identified Carly yet, but I'm looking. Her image is burned into my retina. <laughs> yes, I would recognize her if I see her. I'm, I'm really happy to be here observing this, this almost idyllic scene of elephants um, feeding and, and jousting and playing and resting over there and people standing watching them and it looks like there's no, no animosity at all. But we know from the attack on me and the attack on other people in the area that these elephants are, are on the edge, they're anxious and anything... Okay. Oh, wait just a minute, this is Daniel coming through. Hello, Daniel. Yeah, I just come. OK, we'll be with you in a few minutes. Thank you. Perhaps there we can get a clear enough view and I can see Carly. The herd has migrated towards the valley. In the clearing, Ian can look for Carly without being seen. Peacefully, a mother moves across the clearing with her calf, but it is not Carly. As always, Ian observes the scenery through his camera. The analysis of the footage is an important method to better understand the behavior of this elephant population. But no matter how hard he searches, none of the animals have a hole in their ears. Suddenly, the mood changes. Somebody noticed we were there. And, uh, I don't think they're going to pursue. They're not looking for trouble. I'm trying to avoid trouble. So in the sense, danger. You see danger. I don't think it didn't spray me. Look to move away. I hope we didn't disturb them. Let's go by. So we can see whether they're moving off. Ian and his team retreat. They don't want to provoke an attack. And although he has not found Kali, Ian feels very close to her here. It is the place of their last encounter. I don't blame her for being an elephant. If I could communicate with her, I would, ah, I would say, listen out for the because humans that rumble at her are no danger. Humans that creep quietly and try and get close and carry guns, and she will perhaps perhaps re recognise the smell of cordite. Um, those are the dangerous ones. I am an Ellie friend, <laughs> not an enemy. For Ian Redmond, the encounter with Carly is much more than just a painful accident.
And the important message to the world, I think, is that these elephants are important to this area. And the people who live here live, co coexist with the elephants. They live alongside them peacefully. It's the outsiders coming in to extract the resources, the timber, the charcoal, the bushmeat, and the ivory sometimes. Those are the ones that terrify the elephants. So we need to stop the illegal activity, and then the legal, peaceful grazing of cattle can go on. And this amazing location where people and elephants have, for, for many, many years, lived peacefully side by side, can continue in that way. If the cave elephants and the other inhabitants of the Mount Elgin region have a chance of surviving, then something has to change.